Hello and welcome to the Fans Boxing Podcast, the podcast that asks the questions you want to hear. And I welcome to this week's show, the WBO Intercontinental Middleweight Champion, 15-0, Birmingham's adopted son, Tommy Langford. How are you, Tommy? I'm good, thanks, mate. Not too bad. How are you? Yeah, I'm brilliant. Cheers, mate. Just say um, a bit of breaking news over the last couple of days. Could you just clear it up for us, please, Tommy, mate? Yeah, obviously, uh, Terry Flanagan's. Um, picked, uh, it got an injury, I think tendonitis, something in his foot. So they've had to put the um, the Flanagan Matthews fight back to March the twelfth, and that includes the whole undercard, which obviously I was featuring on fighting for the Commonwealth title. So I'll now fight uh, on uh, March the twelfth instead of February the thirteenth. So yeah, yeah, we've got, just got a month, an extra month to wait. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, how how does that affect you? Obviously, everyone's in the same boat, but how does it affect you personally? Um. It's a little bit, obviously, it's frustrating because I was I was absolutely flying in the gym. You know, my sparring was going really well. I was I was hitting peaking points. So it's annoying because you're like, you feel ready and you're like, and you know it's just around the corner. You you know, it's just around the corner. In my, you know, in my eyes, I was going to get in the ring and I was going to win and be Commonwealth champion. So it's, uh, it's, it's a bit frustrating when you look at it like that. But at the same time, everybody, everybody's in the same boat. you just got to kind of, I mean, I'll have a little bit of a rest because uh, I'm 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 near enough there now, so I don't want to burn out or don't want to go over the top. So I'll have a little bit of a rest and then get back on, get back in the training and get back to all the hard sparring and preparation for March the twelfth. And you know, it's just fixating on the job again. Yeah, of course. I say, like we say, everyone's in the same boat, and yeah, so it's a pity it happens, but that does happen a lot in boxing. So that's one thing got put up with, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's just one of them. Unfortunately, yeah. when when you're not top of the bill. And somebody else is top of the bill. You got to, um, you know, you, you, you kind of. There's a lot of things that can happen that can affect your fight. So it's just one of those, one of those things. But I'll still get the opportunity. I'll still get the fight. So it doesn't really matter. Yes, yeah, brilliant. To say before we get stuck into that fight too much, I'd like to if you rewind on your career, if you could, Tommy, and take us back to where it all started, mate. Yeah, yeah. Carry on. I so say, what, what, what age and what was the motivation in getting in that gym, please, Tommy? Well, basically, I first um, I first started boxing at eleven um, down in uh, Biddeford in North Devon, and the reason was because I was a good football player when I was younger. Um, I was uh, I was actually uh, on the books at Plymouth Argyle, and uh, right, I was yeah. in uh, a couple of centre of excellences when I was a kid. But I was always quite small and uh, quite small for football, and I always wanted to get. I thought I needed to get a bit stronger and. And everything, and I read about a couple of footballers who'd who'd done boxing themselves um, when they were younger. I think uh, Michael Owen done it, and Robbie Fowler done it, and things. Yeah, so yeah. I uh, I kind of um, I thought oh, I'll give that a crack. And my dad had always t- told me loads of stories about boxing. He was a mad boxing fan himself, uh, even though he'd only ever done it in the scouts growing up. So uh, I just took myself down to the local boxing gym and. Just started from there, and I immediately fell in love with it. It was not; it was wicked, really. So, to, how long were you actually training before you got in the ring? Um, I was only training for about, I think, before I got my first fight, about a month. Jesus, that's so quick, I, isn't it? I st- yeah, I started, and then I got my first fight, and that fell through because the kid came in a bit too heavy. Um, and then I fought a couple of months after that, so I had a bit longer till I actually had my first fight, but. I got medical pretty much straight away, signed up and ready to go, really. But um, it, I took to it like a doctor water, really. I kind of just, I always had a knack of throwing a punch, and um, and I was a mad hyperactive kid, so I had loads of energy all the time. So, you know, it it was it was a perfect sport for me, really. And the competitive side of it, the one on one side of it, suited me down to the ground, and you know that's that's what I grew to love, really, and that's still what I love to. The, about the sport today and so it's just um and then over the you know as as time went on i just it, it just was that that was just me really that was me all over boxing <laughs> <laughs> that's great to hear did you say that it was hard to walk away from the football um i played all throughout my teenage years really i, I carried on playing until and i played um adult football for a bit but like i was playing young i was only 16 17 when i was playing but like it the, the clubs I played for always knew that boxing came first so when I was in championships or when I had a fight come up they knew I wouldn't play in football that week or so I carried on carried on playing but then once I got to a certain age I think about 15, 16 
you know, when it when championships came around, I knocked the bo- I knocked the football on the head completely because it just wasn't worth an injury and having to risk missing championships. So yeah. Um, yeah. But I carried on, and when I came to Birmingham and came to uni, I just I, I was, it was pretty much out of the system then. So just boxing was a hundred percent then, really. Yeah, brilliant. Can I say I was a young kid? Can you recap the, the early days of the amateur, the schoolboy days? Just I just really I remember being I used to get it kind of I used to get mega nervous when I was a kid. I don't know why because it wasn't about uh, I didn't ever get nervous about my opponent or worried about my opponent. It was always about kind of what people thought of me but yeah. then as I got older I just like that that didn't phase me anymore and I you know it was it was more excitement then but memories of it, it just I just remember loving it really I just remember loving getting in the ring and the feeling of being of fighting and the, the feeling of training and I've always been a real I've really enjoyed training still really enjoy training now and that's obviously one of the reasons why and I really enjoy learning and feeling like I'm improving and so that's one of the reasons why I'm I'm still improving today and still feel like I'm picking things up because I've got a real thirst for knowledge of the sport and you know so but when I was a kid it just I just enjoyed it full on I, you know I used to whoever was fighting whether it was me like my best mates all came from the same box you know my best mate now is my best man at my wedding Richard Grigg I think he runs bit of a boxing club now but he was like uh, he used to go everywhere together look if he had a fight one weekend I'd just I'd just jump in the car with him. I'd go along as a... Sp- we used to do spares back then. So you all used to turn up and you just weigh in just on the off chance there was anybody there your weight. Oh, really? And, uh, I didn't know that. So, yeah, you used to always do it. And especially down in um, in Devon and across the southwest, it was something that was really common because it was hard to get fights. So I, you used to just go along to every show that you could. And I remember pretty much every weekend, there's every Friday night or every you know uh, weekend during the boxing season, I'd just be jumping in the car and uh, going to Plymouth or to Exeter, uh, Bristol, Camborne, wherever there was a show down in the southwest, we'd go along and jump on the scales on the off chance. And quite, you know, I always, I, I got, I, it paid off for me a good few times until I got recognised and known across the southwest from a boxing. Like, it got, um, I used to get quite a lot of fights through that. And I was always the average weight. So we always used to get, like, there'd always be another lad there who's doing the same thing as me. And, you just jump in the ring and have a and, and have a fight like so. That's crazy to but, think so of that. It was always, um, like me and my two pals, uh, Kyle and Richard, we used to just go everywhere together and like it like whoever got the fight, like we'd all just stay and watch them and uh, and it was like we, we were kind of like a little little team. So it was really good. And then you know, obviously as I got older, it got a bit more serious. Yeah, of course. So say, can you talk us through like your early success and I think it was the schoolboys and juniors and things like that. Yeah, um, I boxed in every. I, I went to the first schoolboys when I was. I'd had like two, two, two fights, I think, or three fights, and um, I, I got through to the semi finals. And uh, I think it was the semi finals. I lost to a kid from London, Sonny Enti. To be fair, he'd done a good. He, he beat me. He beat me fair and square, really. I wasn't really. That's I, very I honest, I, yeah. I was, yeah, no, I wasn't. Uh, I, I, I have to say he was more experienced than me and he knew what he was doing a lot more than me and obviously he had more I didn't really have a clue what the cha- national championships were I didn't know I was just turning up and fighting <laughs> and then, so I think he had more of an idea of the importance of the whole thing and what it meant and everything so yeah I lost in the semis of that one and I think I got to a couple more semis as a schoolboy, and it wasn't until I was a junior and then when I was a junior I won my first um national championship and that was the uh, first year of the, the class A of the NACYPs yeah 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 so I won that one up in Liverpool and I got to uh, and then I won the CYPs a year later I got to the junior ABA final I think it might have been set the final or semi that same year um, the third year I got to uh, the, C- the junior ABA final and lost to Dudley O'Shaughnessy who I'd lost to in the I took a couple of really close fights with Dudley. I think we it should have been fight fight of the tournament really when we fought each other in the um, junior ABA finals in the last year. It was a real uh, real ding dong like it, like he'd land a hell of a combination on me, then I'd land one back because <laughs> we both had a really high work rate a sort of style. It like I think he ended up beating me. It was in Crystal Palace we fought that one, and uh, he ended up winning twenty four twenty one on Ooh. on the on the points. So and you can imagine, you know, yeah, the, way, battle, the way man. they had the score, the way they had the scoring back then, you had to be a, like a solid, clean point to win. 
uh, to get a to get a score in point like and to notch up twenty four and twenty one points. <laughs> it was a real it was a real tear up. And then uh, the next year I got to the um, CYP finals again, and then it went into the seniors. Then so went on from there. You say uh, obviously junior. What was the main main highlight of that junior career then? Uh, winning the winning the um, winning the uh, the CYPs twice, like yeah, yeah. winning it the first time was unbelievable. Because on the way through, I beat like um, I beat two England representatives, I beat a Welsh international, and I beat a Scottish international in the final. So that was kind of like that was that was really big. But then having done that and having beaten who I beat, I still didn't get like a call up to England. I was, and I don't, you know, it was a bit. I was I never really I never I always felt I never really got rubber the green in terms of national selection and things because I was always every year I only ever lost to national champions I never you know in the championships and that I never lost to anybody who didn't win it so it was, it was always a bit frustrating for me because I was com- always competing against the best and, and, and you know holding my own really and never getting uh, never getting selection but I think that was more because of where I was from like you kind of get ignored if you're from the southwest and from Devon and whatever and then Next year, when I won it again, that's when I got my first England call up. So that was a big year for me because obviously, I, I, from then on, I never got ignored. Then I kind of always got every year I got an Engl- selection for England, and so that was a big thing. Cause that started off my international career after that next year. Yeah, yeah. Can you like obviously talk us through the joining the England camp and who was on there with you? Um, where, where did that lead you? So the first, I remember the first camps I went on. I was only like 15, 14, 15. Um, and it, I was on the same camp as like Anthony Gogo, Billy Joe, uh, Michael Maguire, George Groves. Oh, some um, big names. Some, yeah. So when you look at it now, when you look at it now, you know, I've had Olympians on there, uh, you know, world champions, world title contenders, all from that same squad. And um, and uh, like a lot of other lads, good amateurs are on there. You know, good good am- n- names known throughout the amateurs are on there as well. I think Bradley Skeet was in the same squad as me as well, and things like that and we were kind of the follow-on group from the Frankie Gavin James DeGale um, that that Olympic squad we were yeah, the, the, we the juniors yeah. below them and obviously as the years the next year progressed and whatever um, Billy Joe kind of took off he was winning in, in, well as you know he was winning everything and he was obviously he and he established himself he was good enough to be in the full senior team at the age of like 17 so he yes. kind of he got moved up into that next thing and we were still, I was still sort of on the Young England squad. I mean, I think Luke Campbell was in the same squad as us and things and fought on the same internationals as them um, when I was like 16. Um, 16 and then after that, went, um, I didn't get much the next year. I think I fought against South Africa and then the year after that, like when I moved to Birmingham, um, I got a couple of call-ups, fought against Ireland and um, who else did I fought against? that year I can't remember really um, and then Germany um, the year after and then so I pretty much had a call, a call up every a call up or two every year until I was like sort of when I was a senior and established as a senior and you know one of the best in the country I got two or three in the year then and you know went on to in my last year as an amateur actually captain the England team when we went over to Canada for a oh, box brilliant. club so you know and I, I competed against um several lads who went on to Olympic Games the 2012 Olympic Games which you know I was hoping for myself yeah, you know when yeah. I was an amateur I really did make you know that was a goal of mine but I uh, and I went to the same I was on the same GB trials as like uh, Callum Smith and Anthony Fowler and things like that and obviously I got the wins over Fowler and Smith in the amateurs and you yeah, know, that was a, that was a, one of the most questions we had. We had about seven questions about this. Could you just talk us through the win over Callum Smith and Anthony Fowler, where that came and what age you were? Well, when the, the, the win against Smith, it came, I think it was the year, the same year we had the GB trials or the, or it was the year before or something. It was in the, the final year of the CYPs. Yeah. And I should have won them. I should have won them that year. Have it like Callum Smith was the best name in, in, in our weight. And I boxed Callum Smith at the... Um, Drayton Manor, Drayton Manor Hotel, and um, it was a great fight. You know, four round, really great fight, really technical, high pace. He started off very well. He was, I think, he was a point up ahead of me uh, the first round. Stayed a point ahead at the second round, but then I, I kind of started to creep away in the in, with my engine. Yeah. And after the third round, um, 
I ended up at the end of the third round five points up, so I managed to like really turn the tables in the third, and that was just because I put a really high pace on the third round. I'd managed to suss out a particular combination that was working for me, and uh, and then just sort of held the lead in the fourth round, and and I ended up winning by by four points, I think. But um, it was a great fight, and obviously, like I mean, being from North Devon and being from down to the southwest, I didn't really have the I didn't really know what the, who the, the Smith family were so much because yeah. you know it's kind of it's kind of separate. Like once you're from if you're from down south, you could, and my family look, well, I never really read, didn't read too much into boxing news or didn't ever do the internet stuff or Twitter or Facebook or anything when I was a kid. So I didn't really know about all the boxing families and who's really good. I didn't keep an eye on anything like that. So I, and everyone was making a fuss out of how good this Callum Smith was, and I just thought, ah, oh, it's just another kid like I'll fight him. But then afterwards, when I look back at who how good it was and how good a win it was. It was a massive win for me, really. And it made the final disappointing because I really underperformed in the final. I haven't got that. That was the final for me, beating yeah, Callum yeah. Smith and that big name. And we were the two names in the, in the division, really. And I beat Smith. And then, obviously, um, I think I'd, I'd saw a peak too early. And, and then the final, I didn't have it. I, I mean, I boxed a good kid in the final. I boxed Joe Hughes um, from Marlesbury who's won a lot of national titles himself and obviously turned into a good pro himself. And, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with Joe. I've known him all my life, but I always thought I had him in the, it had it in the bag and, you know, and then I just, uh, I just completely underperformed in the final and he nicked me. So, but yeah, that was the, that was the fight against Smith. And then I think it was that next season or later that year that we had the GB, um, the GB box offs, yeah. uh, sorry, the GB trials. And so, he ended up getting selected onto GB um, at 69 kilo, which is what I was going for, and and uh, um, and I obviously never I never got on like which was I was a bit gutted about. Yeah, of course. And they yeah. put on uh, they put on Smith and they kept an eye on, kept an eye on Fowler and then put Fowler on at a later date and you know I beat Fowler that next season I think as well. I mean he beat me in the ABAs and he got another win over me, um, but in the GB box offs when we fought um, the last in 2011. He got another win over me. To be fair, there. I mean, that I, I always think I, I should have had that win, but it was a close fight. But he got me fair and square in the in the ABAs and the semis of the ABAs. You know, I he, he got my number in that one, and I'd done in the one before. So we had a few good fights, and never never boxed Callum again because he was flying on GB and going to internationals. And you went to you the know, Commonwealth, never, I think, wasn't it? After that? went to the Commonwealth, medaled yeah. and got a set of silver in the Commonwealth. And, you know, so I never got never got in the ring with him again. But so I've since gone up and sparred him a lot, and you know now we're different weights in the pros, and you know it, that's all in the past really. Like me, I always I always really liked Callum anyway. You know, I know we had to fight him, but I always really liked him. And he was a nice kid, and the whole family's nice. And I've I've gone up and done a lot of lot of a lot of work with him um, for his last couple of fights, sparring with him for his last couple of fights against Rocky Fielding and, and yeah. the one before against Rabras. So you know it, it's. It, although uh, we were like hot rivals in uh, amateurs, you know, like, since turning pro, it's kind of gone the other way, really. Now and help helping each other out and stuff. <laughs> it's not been other Dylan White and Joshua then. No, no, nothing like that. No, nah, no, nah, <laughs> nah, that's, that's good that, to hear. That's, that's good to hear. Like it. You, you touched on it then. You missed out on the 2012 Olympics, and a stupid question to ask. So how was that? How was that to take at the time? Um, I think. <laughs> I mean, Fred Evans, who qualified at 69 kilo, which was the weight I was going for, he qualified, he got, he won in the qualifiers quite early on. So I knew from quite an early stage that I wouldn't be going. But um, I think it was more frustration. The frustration I had with, I never got the opportunity, I never got put on GB, and I've always felt I was good enough to be on there, considering some of the fighters that were on there. I always felt that I was good enough to be, uh, to be on the GB squad, and have a stab at going or at least get a shot, you know. So, I, I mean, at the same time, Fred Evans is a very good boxer and, you know, he rightfully he qualified at the earliest qualifier and deserved to go. So I, I can't take anything away from that. And, you know, it was just one of those things I, I wasn't I wasn't going to get to go. But I always felt like I, I, I wish I'd had, I wish I'd been on GB and had the, you know, had the opportunity against international opposition, had the opportunity to go to major international tournaments. And, you know, Regardless of whether it was a qualifier or not, I just had the opportunity to like try and medal or try and you know do something because I feel yeah. it would really have brought the best out of me. Um, but 
I, I, as soon as I knew I wasn't, it wasn't an option to go, um, you know, and I wasn't going to get there. I mean, I was, I was a bit, I was obviously gutted, and I was obviously gutted that I wasn't going to get the chance to have a go. But um, I made the, I, I made the decision then, like I wanted to turn pro, and um, made some adjustments in that last year as an amateur, and got myself a job that was going to enable me to keep training to the as much as I needed to. Um, because obviously I wasn't on any funding or anything, so I and so when I turned pro, I needed a, a job to support it, and managed to get one that was going to allow me the free time to train, and just um, just made you know me and my trainer at the time made a decision and um, moved on from there. Really, got a manager and uh, turned professional. Yeah, because was it was it John Pegg you turned over with? Yeah, originally I turned over with John Pegg, and you know I needed. Well, I'd, I'd been speaking to um, Dean Powell, um, who obviously, you know, God rest him, you know, yeah. he was Frank's, Frank's right-hand man, really, and the matchmaker for running. Frank Warren and stuff, yeah. And I got on with Dean, and I was speaking to him, but it was the pit of the recession at that time of turning pro, and, you know, they'd just launched Ox Nation, and there wasn't really, there wasn't any money in the pot. This is not, this is not Frank Warren, but there wasn't any money in the pot across the board in professional boxing, you know, in any business, regardless regardless of boxing, in any business across the board, everybody was struggling. And, uh, you know, I made, I wanted to turn professional and I'd speak it to Dean and they made, you know, they made some, they wanted, they showed interest in me and wanted to do it, but it was taking a lot, uh, a while to come into fruition. So I said, you know what, like I'll just, I'll turn pro and uh, I'll start off my career and, if it works out at a later date and you know I always kept in touch with him and you know over the years and kept over the start of my pro career and kept in touch and let him know I was getting on and then it developed into uh, you know um, when Dean passed away like um, Jason McCory took over and then Jason said you know what well, you know we'll, we'll get you signed to Frank sort of thing and um, and which is what we've been what we've been looking at and what we've been, we've been wanting to do since the day dot really since I turned pro, I wanted to go down. The, I wanted to be with Frank Warren. I, you know, I wanted to be in that setup. And obviously, Frankie was. Uh, he'd come back to my gym at that point, you know, from Manchester, and uh, he was a big influence on on me in my in the later of my amateur career and turning professional and stuff. And he was with Frank, and but I knew that he was the Frank was the right person for me, um, you know, in terms of career and everything like that. So, and then we yeah. made managed to negotiate that and make that deal and. Um, and the rest and moved on from there really and I was really happy and that kind of signified uh, a real change for me in terms of you know my confidence and everything in terms of boxing because I'd struggled up to that point you know I had obviously I, I you know I had a great amateur career and won national titles and boxed for England and it was a fantastic experience but when you're always eyeing that level above and you always want that and believe you're good enough for it which I did believe I was good enough to be on the higher pedestal, on the GB, going to international tournaments, and never quite getting it, like never getting a rub of the green with selection or in terms of championships or things like that, like points going against you and whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, it kind of like it's fine, and then you turn pro, and obviously with everyone who'd been on that GB and turn pro, the turn pro was such a um, a backing, and like yeah. uh, you know, if, you know, look at Anthony Agogo, he turned pro from going to Olympics, and he ended up with, you know, Golden, Golden Boy. Golden Boy, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of the difference, you, you know, whether he, I'd been a good amateur and I'd been on the same squads as all them, competing with all those lads all throughout my amateur career. Then I'd turned pro and was on small all and nobody knew who I was. And, and, and it wasn't like, I wasn't well known, although I was getting results and doing everything I had to be done. And I always believed I was good enough and believed that, I, you know, people should be paying attention to me, but they weren't. It's not, you know, just they just weren't. That's just the nature of the sport. If yeah. you're not in the limelight and you're not, you're not the main name at that time. You're not going to get the, not going to get the headlines. And so I, I understand what it, you're, totally what you're saying there, but don't you think like oh, I'm a local, I've got a local fan down here in East Anglia. But is it, is it good to have like build your base up in Birmingham, having them early fights there? Yeah, so I mean, the fan base behind help. you. That did help. Obviously, not being from Birmingham originally yeah. and moving up here and stuff it was important for me to build a fan base and and it, it taught me the value of of a great of good support and ticket sales you know how important exactly, they are yeah. and now obviously i've gone on to i sell a lot of tickets now at all my fights whether i'm traveling away or at home and i've got really loyal 
fans and really loyal support and you know, which is something I'm massively thankful for. And with, if I hadn't started off in Birmingham, I probably wouldn't have had that. Uh, sorry, if I hadn't started off in the small hall, I probably wouldn't have had that loyal fan base and probably exactly. wouldn't have had those people seeing every one of my fights progressing and then wanting to get on board and come to the bigger fights. I think you, know, you, t- you hit the nail on the head with that one, mate, So I think the same with know, me down here. It's great to see you follow them from the early on and then follow the journey onto the bigger stage, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a big thing, and the fans like it themselves. They like to be able to say, you know, I watched him from the first one, and I'm yeah. still here now, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so it, it is it is nice in that sense, but from a financial sense as a fighter, <laughs> you know, you kind of, you want that break, do you know what I mean? You yeah, wanna, exactly, you want mate, that, exactly. You want that break when you turn pro, and it's hard otherwise. It is, I'm not going to lie, it's hard, because you're not getting paid much on the small law, and, you know, you have to stay on your feet, and you have to fight journeymen who are horrible, and you can't get them out of there, because they just know how to survive, and... You know, it doesn't always look pretty because they know how to make you look bad yeah. and stuff. And so you're getting through the fights and stuff, and yeah, maybe not getting the deserved. But you kind yes. of. But then once you break through, and you know, once I got that, once I'd signed and with Frank and everything, it was just a relief. Really, it was kind of like, oh, someone's putting the back in me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Someone's believing me and 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 put investing, and then you like, and and then from then on, it's been a uh, every fight. There's been a progression and. And I think that's been visible in every performance, really. Yeah, because I remember when you first signed for Frank Warren, a lot of people saying that he lacks power and stuff like that with the one yeah. stoppage at the time. But if you look in the people you went in with, like you say, surviving journeymen, British ones, hard men, you don't get these people out of there, do you? So it's who you go in no, with at the time, isn't it? No. If, you, if, you're in, if you're in boxing and you, know the, if, and you know the business and you know the way it works, you know those lads. They'd, you know, then you know they're very hard to get out of there, and yeah. unless you're unless you've got real freak power, they're very hard to put away over four rounds or six rounds because they do survive. And you know, I'm still never going to say I'm not going to say I'm a one, I'm never going to be a one punch power knockout artist. But I I I I stop people with accumulative effect, and I land a lot of punches on the button, and so it breaks people up. But against journeymen, you can't even break them up. They're so tight behind their guard and so hard and tough. And, yeah, exactly. And you're hitting them in the places and you're hurting your hands hitting them. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, it, you can't you can't read a lot into um, a lot of fighters who fight on that British small hall scene. They're fighting the same fighters um, as each other and no one's stopping them. You know, no. I mean, look at Dan Blackwell. He's been stopped once by Liam Williams and that was like very early in his career. Debatable as well, wasn't it? Yeah, and that was debatable. And you know, and Liam Williams, I know him very well. I spy him a lot, and he is a banger. But like, in the fact that that was debatable, and he's gone on to never be stopped again, yeah. it's a bit of a statement, really. You know, no one puts him away. So it's one of those when you're fighting those sort of fighters. I think you need to try and put it out, which I never used to do. I used to try and I used to try and stop everybody. I'd throw <laughs> hundreds of punches, and I think that was show, that was seen in some of my early fights on TV. I threw so many punches. That it, you know, it kind of, I was almost tiring myself out, or um, it, it didn't, it didn't look as crisp or as clean as when I slowed down, you know, when I took my time a little bit and picked my shots, which I still throw a high volume of punches, but it's throwing them, I throw them more at the right times now because I've learned to adapt, and you know, when I first turned pro, I was throwing everything, and I was, you know, I was letting everything go all the time, and you're never going to get. You know, when you're never, never going to get anybody out of there, you need to just sort of relax and just, you know, just notch up a clean points win, really, which is what which is what you end up doing anyway. Yeah, you touched on yourself, like you're moving on to like the ten rounders now, and uh, you seem to be getting the stoppages now. Is it because like you like just like you said, wearing people down as the, as the fight go on? Yeah, I've always had a, I've always I'm naturally gifted, really, in terms of I've always had a very big engine. I've, I don't know anybody who's fitter than me really like I've, I'm, I'm very lucky in that sense but um, so I knew the longer rounds would suit me because I knew like I, I set a high pace anyway and people are going to fade and regardless of how tough you are if you're getting hit and clean and, and you know I'm, I'm accurate in my punches so regardless of how tough you are if you're getting caught with a lot of punches you know every round and you're notching up the rounds and it's steadily going by you know it, you you do break people up. You do break break people's heart because they ne- you, they 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 suddenly realise this guy's not slowing down and you know and and you're constantly hitting them and in in different places. And I, I've become a bit of a body puncher now as well. Like I'm starting to develop a bit. You know, I'm developing power punching to the body and as Wayne um, found out. Yeah, 
Yeah, so that's <laughs> something that I think that's that's you know they're obviously my best and most effective shots, and that combined with the fact that I put a high work rate on things and you know by attacking numbers, it's the, if you hurt someone to the body and they're tight and they're slowing, the last thing they want is a four or five punch combination coming at them, hitting them from all different angles. <laughs> so it is it is kind of some, that is something that over the longer rounds. I think people think, do you know what? This is this is painful. Like <laughs> I'm taking a lot of punches here, and and uh, you end up just break you break break them down, and and um, and that's how you, that's how I'm putting them away, really, and that's how I see it continuing, really. I don't see. I think, you know, when people let punches go against me and let shots go, if they don't go into survival mode, if they leave, if they let shots go, they leave themselves open to be countered, and and they leave themselves open to. To, for me to land shots and land combinations on them, and you know that's that's what I do, and and then and then they end up it'll end up it'll end up being their downfall really. So um, unless people go and you come in the ring with me and just try and survive, I think it, you're gonna there's gonna just be a lot more stoppages. And obviously I'm at the stage now where every fight's a championship fight. So unless someone bottles it, they're never going to come in the ring to uh, just survive. Yeah. They're going to come try and beat me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, of course, yeah, of course. Well, you picked up your first title that was um, over in Dublin. How much that? Um, sorry, how much did that mean to you, the WBO Intercontinental title? Um, it was. It meant a lot, and it was. It was a title that we wanted. It was a. You know, we want. I wanted to get in that um, international scene and get on the in the world rankings. Um, you know, myself and the you know the WBO Intercontinental fell into place, and we were supposed to fight. Um, an undefeated German at that, you know, for the title. Um, he's gone on to lose since. I mean, his record was pumped up, like, but yeah. um, it would have been a really nice scout to start off with. Anyway, he pulled out, and we got the Mexican coming, and and I just did the job on him that I had to do, really. But like, winning the first title is always a big thing, and to win one that puts you in world rankings, and then all of a sudden you look at the WBO rankings and you're mixed in amongst names like, you know, Andy Lee, Billy Joe, and yeah. you know, and Hassan and Dam and uh, you know, people like that. It's it's kind of a it's a nice thing. You know, you're not ever going to say, "Oh, yeah, all of a sudden I'm on that level." But it's nice to be ranked amongst those sort of fighters and to see your name up there. And since that one, obviously, again, it's another boost of confidence. Winning that first title is a big boost of confidence. And exactly, it, again, it shows pe- it shows people having faith in you to go out and you know push you down that road and. And, and things and so you know it's, it, it, my confidence jumped again and then and and the performances have jumped again since then yeah how do you get on uh, we went in Rios next didn't you that was yeah. a 10 rounder how do you get on with going over the 10 rounds um, I think the 10 rounds was, it was something that very that needed to be done having yeah. you know I'd never been over 6 at that point and um, it uh, it had to be done but that Rios was tough like I couldn't believe how much because he took some punishment and he, yeah, you know, that he, fight, in yeah. that fight, he took took a lot of shots. And I think I underestimated actually. I underestimated him before the fight. I felt I thought oh, I'll stop this geezer, but then really looking at his record, who he'd been in a ring with, and he'd not never been stopped himself. And you know, he'd been in with the likes of Sebastian Highland and got draws against them, and never been he hadn't been beaten for the three years before me fighting him. I think I I didn't I devalued him a little bit and. He was better than what I thought, and you know, really, his world, his ranking was like forty-four or something in the world at that time, yeah. and so uh, I, it was a bit of an, it was, <laughs> I, um, you know, it surprised me that he stayed in there for as long as he did. But he had this, you know, they brought over Argentina TV with him and everything, so he was really coming to try and cause an upset. And he tried it late on. He tried to wear. He, he said afterwards to me, you know, I spoke briefly, and he said, you know, we knew you were going to come at a high tempo and so we tried to sort of weather the early storm and then and and then you know take you late but then he said I just couldn't do it he said I couldn't out, I couldn't outwork you in any round <laughs> so it's a nice compliment to take when someone said they could really come to try and beat you and they haven't been able to do it um, yeah. but um, it was a very it was a much much needed thing to go over those 10 rounds and to do them at the pace that I did them at it kind of it's I think it's it, it put a bit it put a scare down a lot of people really although I didn't stop him you you know when you're in the ring with me, you're gonna be in for a hard night's work, whether it's ten rounds or you know, you know you're gonna have me come in for the whole fight. Like so, it was a bit. It, although I didn't stop him, I made a statement in a, in a different way, really. Because yeah, in your next fight, as uh, near Christmas, weren't it? 
that's now that 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 stoppage is now a contender for punch of the month. Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't think I don't think I win it. To be fair, I don't think you can argue with uh, obviously Enzo knocking out um, Roy Jones Jr. Just the fact it was Roy Jones Jr. Yeah. He was put to sleep is a big thing. But uh, I, I I don't think you can argue with Liam Williams jab knocking the, the jab. Out, yeah, that was knocking oh, that's a clean really... out. Like, yeah, I wouldn't I... try and say I wouldn't try and say my punch is beating them two, but like. Yeah, it's nice to be in there, and obviously that win in December was. Uh, although it, I was really, it was the job that I was supposed to do on him. Um, I think I did a more impressive, a more impressive job than people expected, and putting him away faster than Chris Eubank Jr. was a nice thing as well. <laughs> yeah, it always helps, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Now, obviously, moving into the new year, you um, announced the fight Lewis Talley, as we said, and it's been changed. And was that always down as the Commonwealth belt? Or was that chucked in later? Um, it was kind of behind the scenes, yeah. We were always going to get yeah. the, the Commonwealth. Was, once Billy Joe had won the world title, because obviously he was the Commonwealth champion um, previously, once he'd won, the Commonwealth was vacant, and obviously we, we knew that was going to happen, and so got in there, and it was always the plan to pick up that Commonwealth title, but, um, you know, uh, so that was always the target, and and that's why we kind of need a British opponent for it, and Lewis Taylor brings the right stuff to the table. He's being... You know, although I think he's had to relinquish it now, but he was the current he's the current English champion. You know, he's got a good record himself. He's been in with you know, I know he lost to Eamon O'Kane, but he's been That's in with a tight Eamon fight, O'Kane. You know, and it was a tight fight and and and, and all that lot. So uh you know, it, it's a good fight, it's a good domestic fight, you know, on paper it's a fifty fifty fight and um it's it's a good one for the fans and um you know, so it's it's a, it's a, it's a good fight for me, and he should bring present something new as well. You know, he's the same size as me; he's a big middleweight himself, and he's a good boxer. You know, I've not been in the ring; I've been in the ring with some awkward fighters and some very clever fighters. You know, Rios was clever, Wiley knew knew the game, but you know, you'd say technically, Lewis is probably a better boxer. Whether he's cleverer than Rios, I don't know, but um, you know, so it, it 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 you know, arguably it's a it's a step up for me and. And um, at the right time as well, you know, it's the time when I'm looking. I want to, I want to do a real, put a real performance in and win in style, and um, you know that could separate me from sort of domestic level opposition. Really, being that he's English champion and everything, if I do a really good job on him, which I'm sure I will do, then it will sort of, you know, I'm kind of bridging the gap towards, you know, obviously I know you've got Blackwell and Eubank who are fighting for the British. And depending on who wins that and whatever, then we go for that one. But if if not, then the next the next spot really is the European or the world. And with me being ranked number four now in the WBO and Billy Joe the world champion, it's a real makeable fight down the line. And I've just got to establish myself to be of that level and to be worthy of um, a world title shot, which I believe I am. I've just got to establish it and make the public believe it. And then it's a big fight to be made. Yeah, of course. But... um. Looking at the Lewis Taylor fight, when it comes to making the game plan for a fight, is it something you and your trainer sit down and do, or is it something he does on his own? Um, to be honest with you, like, it's I don't watch. I, I haven't man, I managed to find a huge amount of footage on Taylor anyway. Like, there's a lot no, more footage on him than on him. There's not a lot on him. He's he's a tall. He's he, you know he he attacks beyond a jab, and then he looks as if he tries to get him close and throw combinations in close. So, um, it's not really something that. We've got a, there's a there's a tactic and a game plan, but at the end of the day, watching him fight against journeyman as you know, or against other fighters that you can see on YouTube, it ain't fighting against me. So he ain't gonna be able he ain't gonna fight like that against me. And really, as long as I go out there and put my stamp on the fight and start off with you know with my game plan and put that into effect, he has to adjust around me really. And 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 I think that's gonna be. The difference, you know, I do believe I'm I'm a step above Taylor. I'm a level above him in terms of uh, ability. You know, I've boxed throughout my amateur career against against uh, amateur and professional career. I've been in and shared the ring with you know world level fighters. Um, in and inspiring and since turning professional, I've sparred world champions and things and I've made a good account of myself. And obviously throughout the amateurs, as you know, like I've been in with like Olympic medalists and world medalists and things. So. I do believe I'll be technically a level above um, Taylor, and I think that will show on the night. And I, it's just a case of outboxing him, and then as the rounds go on, breaking him up. And 
you know, don't get me wrong, he's a, he's a good kid, and um, you know, from what I've been told, he's a nice kid, never thinking. I hope he has a you know a good training camp and brings his best on the night. This is you know this is a big big fight for both of us, and he'll be looking to upset the apple cart, and I'm I'm well aware of that, and I'm treating him like with you know treating it with the utmost utmost respect, but I'm going to go out and do a real job on him. Yeah, so that's great to hear. That's going to make him for a great fight. But like you touched on it then, you, when it comes to winning the if you win when you win the belt, is it something you're looking to defend to win outright, or is it always just a stepping stone towards towards well, that world title? The, the Commonwealth. Once you win the Commonwealth, like you've won it as, uh, as far as I'm aware, I don't know. I don't think you have to have any defences. Oh, right, so yeah. The Commonwealth. I don't think you have to. I'm not. I, I'm not too sure on it. You might. You might have to. I don't know. But yeah. obviously, I want. I want to keep the belt. I want to keep the belt. So if I have to make defences to keep it, I'll, I'll do that. Because I want to keep it. I want some silverware for her. You know, my yeah. family just whatever and things like that. And but I mean, the Lonsdale belt. Obviously, that's you know the British one. That's the one that everybody wants. And that in yeah. terms of. Uh, in terms of defending it and owning the Lonsdale belt outright, that you know, if you get if you win that, then I think it's only natural to say, you know, I want to defend it three times and keep it. But um, in terms of career path, it might not be the best. It's not always the best move, and people always say, "I want to fight for the British." It's such a big title. The British is it is, and I you know I'm not saying it's not. But in terms of career and progression, you know, um, and and notching up the points in the world rankings and also in terms of financial package, you're, you're you're better off going down the route of going down European and world titles, really. But um, that being said, if Chris Eubank Jr. Is, is the British champion, that's the fight you go for. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, it's a big course. money fight. Where, whichever fight he's involved in, whether it's domestic, worldwide or otherwise, it's, it is a big payday. Uh, it's a big financial fight and, it, and it's well worth... The, well worth the risk because the, because of the reward of it. Obviously, beating him is the one. <laughs> That's really nice to say. You beat him <laughs> simply because of who he is and everything. But yeah. then also, it's got the appeal of the Lansdale belt would be attached to it. You know, if he comes through Blackwell, and then uh, you know, and obviously a nice financial side to it as well. I mean, you're on the on the flip side, if Blackwell wins, which I hope he does, because I really like Nick and I know him, know him quite well. Um, if Blackwell wins, he'll have defended it three times. So then it's a case of whether he decides to hold on to it um, or if he uh, decides to vacate and move on, in which case if he vacates and you fight somebody else. Or if he holds on to it, then it's a, it's a big domestic clash. Um, but you'd hope that something else could be put on it because I think that fight is a bigger fight than just the British, if you know what I mean. Yeah, of course, of course. I say the best thing about uh, the middleweight division and the people around you, you're all at a similar age, you're around like, 26, 27, so these fights can build into, like, like we say, world-level fights as well, couldn't they? Yeah, and obviously there's the potential for massive rivalry down the line, you know. I mean, if you manage, if if you fight, uh, you know, <laughs> let's say argument's sake, I fight Billy Joe Saunders next year, and, you know, it's a good, it's a great fight, close fight or whatever, there's argument for a, a, a return in there. You know, and then you can have a trilogy. Yeah. You can turn back the clock to the, the time of the nineties of the Eubanks and Bens and things. That's and what we're really, looking forward to. And really, that's kind of what you want. You want, you need. Your career can sometimes be um, remembered and highlighted by those around you and who's at your weight around you. I mean, if you look at some of the, I mean, when Mike Tyson was world champion on top of the world, who was there to compete with him? There wasn't really anybody. I know Lennox no, came along no. later, but it was at the end of his career, and it's sort of. You can your legacy, or if you're going to talk about legacies and things like that, but your career can be highlighted by who you fight and the the trilogies or the the return matches or the hard grudge grudge matches that you have. Uh, it, that can really, you know, that can really notch you up, like in terms of in terms of your career and and how it's remembered. And those are fights that you want, and that's that's only it's only natural. You know, you want to get to a position where. You can have big fights and demand, you know, big fights. But um, it, regardless of winning or losing, it's going to be remembered and it's going to be a, a, um, a big thing. And I think with having Eubank in the division and obviously now Billy Joe being a world champion and he's also British, you know, you've got a few other fighters like Blackwell, myself, and who are hot on the heels and wanting to get up in and around that, and um, you know, and. And then there's others coming through a bit younger. You know, you can get to a point where you've got four or five, which we're starting to get now, all of that world-level sort of, world-level um, 
fighters in the same division, and then it's a, you know it's a shame if you don't all fight each other because you all fight and you can regardless win or lose or draw, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be an exciting outcome for the fans and. You know, there's return matches and trilogies and it can just build and escalate and do something massive then and that is ultimately what you want and that's what you want in your career. I'd say a question about yourself because you come across as a cool, calm and collective guy but what happens in them days when people start getting your face at press conference? Are we going to see a different side of you? Do you know what, like, it doesn't, press conferences and all that, like, it doesn't really matter. If someone says what they say and if the fighter says something, you know, it doesn't really bother me because I'm just like, well, I'm going to fight you in two days. I'm going to fight you <laughs> next week. It doesn't really bother me. Because nah. I've always been like that. If someone's ever had a stab at me, but they're going to face me or something, it doesn't really affect me. I just kind of think, well, it's pointless you're talking. Or if, someone's, if someone talks a lot of rubbish about you and says a lot of things, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, then ultimately they're the one under pressure because they've got to back it up. And if they don't back it up, then they look stupid. But yeah. if if... I mean, you know, and so ultimately they're putting themselves under pressure, so I just let them talk. And at the same time, it doesn't really matter to me. If someone's trying to wind me up and get under my skin by slagging me off, I just think it's just stupid because at the end of the day, we're going to fight anyway. So how does it, what does it matter about what you say about me? You've just got to do it in the ring. It doesn't really matter what someone says. So I don't really, I don't really think I respond to that. You know, other people saying things, like media or press or uh, general public, it, I can see how that can get under people's skin because you just think, well, what do you know? How, you know, yeah, how exactly. like, sometimes like you see Twitter trolls and things like that, and you know, having to go at fighters and stuff, and you think, well, at the same time, how easy you can say just ignore it. He doesn't know anything because they don't. You mm -hmm. kind of also think, you know, well, why are you saying that? Why are they saying that? So it, I can see how that can kind of get under people's skin, but you, you just have to look at who's saying it and think, well. Oh, well, that's what they look like, or you know, that's the, <laughs> you know, just have a laugh about it. Really, as yeah, soon as you exactly. do that, then it kind of goes out your head. But yeah, no, I don't think I'll let you, you'll see that side of me. I mean, if someone can, if someone can, it says something against me. I'm only going to answer back with facts and what I believe and what I believe to be right. You know, if someone says they think they're going to beat me, if they think they can, if they say something matter of fact, like you know, I'm going to beat you because I'm, I'm I'm faster than you. I've got better feet than you. I'm a slicker boxer than you. You know. That's that's a fair enough comment, but if they're saying something like if they can't back it up, then it's just stupid. They're just saying things stupidly. I'm gonna knock you out, and well, how? Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. someone can't someone can't back it up, and you just think it's well, what does it matter really? So I'm I'm very much the same. I ain't gonna slag anybody or say anything unless I know unless I know f the facts behind it, and I know I'm um what I'm saying is right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, say so, um building up to this fight, uh, who have you been sparring in camp, and how, obviously how has camp been going? Well, up until obviously the news that the fight had been uh, postponed, uh, yeah, it, I was flying. Um, I done. I mean, last year really was the. Hot, hot, I had some brilliant sparring. I learned a lot in my sparring. I've been sparring. You know, I went down to spar because she ranked sparred Karen Smith a couple of times in a couple of camps. Um, I spun up and sparred Liam Smith for his um, before his last fight and. Hassan and Dam as well, so you know I'd been mixing with world level and world champions throughout the whole of last year, really, and and um, that brought me on massively. Um, you know, having that sort of caliber, you sort of things rub off on you, and you learn things, and and you know if you're holding your own as well, and you're taking something out of sparring, and it's it's something that's um, you know you enjoy as well. It's brilliant, you know. So I took a lot from that, but obviously this camp being early in the year and stuff it, it was originally hard to get um it was going to be hard to get sparring but i've had i've had some very good sharp um amateur sparring tall amateur sparring and then uh a lad called ben whitaker who's on g in the gb squad now um but i've also been sparring lads from wales alex hughes he was you know he's an upcoming prospect um zach parker an upcoming prospect as well um and then I've been, I, I did a bit, with, I even did a bit with uh, Sam Eggington um, the last the last week until obviously I had the news that it was been postponed. But um, so it's been a bit, bit of a mix in terms of the, the sparring. But you know, good quality sparring is hard to find. So if you can get somebody that is top notch in quality on the local on the doorstep to you, then it, it doesn't matter whether they suit the style or of your opponent. Really. Uh, you're always learning, so you know it's just about learning. All the sparring I can get, if I get the better sparring, I can get the better for me because I'm always going to learn. And 
you know, I'm hoping that I can nail down a big sponsor in the next, um, you know, next in the coming months because that would make it easier for me because obviously then you can pay someone to come over and spar you and you've got the option of you're never going to have to worry about, you know, organising sparring or getting sparring. You can bring somebody over and um, so that's really where I'm going with it and where I'm hoping to go, really. As I say, it's brilliant to hear, mate. So um, I was at York Hall last Friday. Did you enjoy your night there? Yeah, it was good, man. I enjoyed it. I, yeah. I like doing all that. I like doing that pun. It's, it's good. It's a, you know, I, I love boxing and I'm, you know, I love love being involved in it. And so any anything I can do to do with it, and you know, and obviously it's a bonus. It gets my name out there a bit more. Yeah, of course. And, you know, in terms of the profile. Who, and, sorry, you know, people so who weren't there, they watch it on the telly and they see you talking about your bit, and then they expect you to go sit down in the green room with a nice cup of tea or sparkling water. But you were sitting there on a. <laughs> A school chair, shall we say, on the on the stage when you're watching yeah, the fight. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit yeah. weird, to be fair. Yeah, no, yeah, you're sitting the booth, then you're sitting up on, uh, sitting <laughs> on the stage, school chair. But you know what? Like your call has uh, always been the same, and so. But I, like I said, I just enjoy it all. I, I really, I had a good time last week. I thought it was a good show, and it was a good show. Watching wasn't it? the action and uh, enjoyed comment on it, and I felt like you know everyone said I got quite good feedback on what I'd said, so. You know, I'm glad I'm not sounding stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you said touched on yourself. Do you get to many shows then? Over um, the year? Do you know what? Like, although I love boxing and I, I, I obviously it's my profession and everything. I've, I've, I've got a life outside of it, and I think people forget that boxers, not everything they do, and hundred percent, and all they all they do is box. Like I've, you know. I've got a wife who doesn't want to know, doesn't want to be, <laughs> in, doesn't want to have to have boxing on her brain twenty four seven, seven days a week, all year round. So, you know, and I put her through hell really when I'm in training camp and dieting and stuff. It's a pain. It's a pain for her. So, I, I actually I try and switch off sometimes when I'm out of training and things. I try and switch off from boxing and spend time with my family. And you know, I go to the football. I got, I'm you know avid Albion fan. I go every game to the Albion. Yeah. So, but, you know, I go to the I go to um I go to the odd show. I go to a lot of you know obviously I go to uh, a lot of the Frank Warren shows, the big shows and things and and um but I watch a hell of a lot on TV. Watch loads on yeah. um, watch watch loads of boxing on TV, whether it's new or old stuff. I watch loads of it. So um I don't go to I'm not I'm not like a regular at the local boxing show to be fair because. I have to uh, have to put in a sh- have to put in a shift at home every now and then. <laughs> yeah, keep the missus happy. That's the yeah, one battle yeah. you can't win, in it? Yeah, that's it. So, <laughs> just a couple of questions here for you, mate. Because it comes to the end of the hour, just to say, um, what venue or stadium are you looking forward to is fighting in? Um, would it would it be the Hawthorn? Yeah, if I could if I could fight at the Hawthorn, like that'd be unbelievable. Do you know what I mean? Like it's something that obviously Richie Woodall he wanted to do when he was world champion, and. Uh, being a being a West Brom fan, and obviously being compared to him closely, it'd be nice to get nice to get the fight at the Hawthorns. And you know, if I had keep building them, my fan base as it's going, it's something I'm sure I could fill up with Albion fans. Do you know what I mean? So that'd be massive. But then I like I like um, I do like fighting on the local smaller places. Like if you pack it out, the atmosphere is unbelievable. Like Wolverhampton Civic's always got good atmosphere, and it's always been a venue I've enjoyed fighting at. And so. But yeah, I'd say probably domestically, if I could ever, if I could ever fight a show at the Hawthorns, it'd be that, that be, it'd be that one, or you know, worldwide, that'd be Vegas, innit? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because like I say, it's the pinnacle of your career, innit? Yeah, Getting yeah. Out there. That's good. okay. So it's been brilliant talking to you tonight, and I appreciate every second you give to us, mate. Um, just one more question before you go. I hate to ask you this, but looking past Lewis, but is there anyone out there you'd like to fight? And he mentioned a few names, but um, obviously, I think. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't look at anybody and think, you know, I really want to fight them. I really want to fight them. I'll fight. I will. I am genuinely of the nature. I'll fight anybody if it's right and never the right thing on the line and everything. I'll fight anybody. I'm not, I'm not fussed to or who are bucks. Um, I've always had that about me. I've always done that in the amateurs. I fought anyone, and I'll do the same in the pros. But I think you've always got to look above you. You've always got to look at, um, you know, the world champions and obviously Billy Joe being a WO world champion. And me being in that ranking body, I've yeah. got to, I've got to look at him, and uh, you know it'd be a great fight with him. But I'm well aware it's down the line a bit, a bit more. But then probably a closer fight is uh you know Eubank. I'd love to I'd love to fight Eubank and beat Eubank up. 
<laughs> You're not the only person there, I don't think, mate. No, I know. I think there's a queue that goes on the block, doesn't it? Everyone wants to <laughs> Grab a ticket, innit? Yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously, one more question. What's your thoughts on GGG in the same um, way as you? He's, you know what, you, you can't say anything other than he's, he's the man and he's to be, yeah. he's a beast, he's a beast. Look, I mean, it, it's, you, you want to be able to say everybody's beatable and I do think you can beat him. You know, he's, he, he is hittable, he's shown that you can hit him. So if yeah. you can hit somebody, you can put him away, but who the right person to do that and who, who can do that is a different, is, is a different thing altogether. Um, you know, he, he's very good. I think the sort of fight you've got to do against him, you've just got to go out, flat out, pedal to the metal, and just see yeah. if you can put him away in the first few rounds or, you know, <laughs> get ahead on the points and then accidentally headbutt him and get it, you know, yeah. get on points for that. <laughs> but, uh, Tricks you know, tried no, there. He's, yeah, yeah, he's, he's, the, he's the real deal, to be fair. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't see anybody in the middleweight division um, getting close to him. So I think really what's going to, define his career he's going to have to move up at some stage yeah, yeah. Um, he's going to have to move up and he's going to have to compete against bigger opposition and if he shows his worth at that like he's you know he's going to be remembered as one of the greats to be fair and you know I think the only way you can beat him is if you've got so, uh, someone like a, a star like Marvin Hagler who just was hard as nails but yeah. also punched tremendously hard himself and you know just, just had it off of him and ended up breaking down I think if you could do that to him you know, you could get him, but I don't see anybody out there at the moment who could do it. And you know, uh, so, so yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty daunting, daunting prospect, really, having him at the top, <laughs> at the top of the tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll say, I look to say, it's been brilliant talking to you, Tommy, and I appreciate every second, mate. And I'd love to get you back on in the future, and all the best for that fight coming up. No problem, mate. Thanks very much. Thank all you. All right, cheers, Tommy. I'll cheers, speak to you cheers. soon, mate. All the best. Yeah, ciao, ciao. Bye, bye.